until I talked to Paul Cave, I didn't realise that 200,000 people a year climb the Sydney Harbour Bridge. I also didn't realise how difficult it was to get that project off the ground. It took nine years. And it wouldn't have happened if Paul Cave hadn't have had a really nasty problem with the bureaucracy when he was running or developing a tile business. And he learnt through that how you go about the process. And I think a really big lesson from the talk with Paul Cave is that when you get an idea, whether it be through a big company or when you're starting your own business, it can often take a lot longer than you expect and that, that length of time is extended if you have to deal with governments or unions or all sorts of other bodies. But if your idea is good, you can make a lot of money. Paul, I knew your father, the late Les Cave, and uh, he uh, became uh, the CEO of one of our larger companies. Why didn't you go into the big corporate arena yourself? <laughs> a good example? For a good example. Yes. I, I think watching him, uh, he was an incredible inspiration in my life. He was such a competitive guy. Uh, um, but also financially, you once you're a chief executive, there's a lid on what you can earn. And uh, you've got to play with that political system in public companies um, and corporate governance and those sorts of things. So I always really wanted to do my own thing. Of course, in those days, the CEOs didn't get paid a lot either in the, in the, in the big companies. No, so. not really, no. So you started yeah. off and you started Amber Tiles, is that after a few things, is that right? Yes, yes, uh, Amber was the first business I, I started and I ran it for about 25 years. Probably stayed about five years beyond my use-by date, but uh, yes. But uh, you actually became one of the largest tile uh, retailers in the country, didn't you? Yes, we did. We had about uh, 18 outlets and we were manufacturing some product as well. So we were in paving bricks and ceramic tiles. And, and then you sell it to the staff. What did you do that for? Well, look, as I said, I think I stayed beyond my use-by date and the business really needed to franchise and I really was the, the person who stopped that happening because people who I'd been effectively in partnership with uh, didn't really want the rules to change into franchising and I really was the showstopper so it was I, I in the end uh, needed to move out and the business has since franchised and, and done very well. So you think there's, in, in terms of entrepreneurs there's a time to leave? Absolutely and, and often entrepreneurs do need a kick upstairs. Uh, I know I've <laughs> needed a nudge a few, few times and, and I think that's really important to, because on, entrepreneurs are so passionate and so emotionally involved in businesses that they frequently can't see uh, a lot of other aspects. Uh, it's a mistake a lot of them make, isn't it? It's a, it's, a, it's a frequent mistake. Most entrepreneurs are not good operational people. Uh, they're much better with their sniffer, they're much better uh, with the passion and the idea and the drive, and they need to be complemented invariably with other, with other skills. So how did you get the idea of uh, people climbing the bridge as a <laughs> tourist attraction and a business? Robert, it started, it's a long story, but as a 19-year-old, I, I met the man who was to become my father-in-law, and on the day the bridge opened, uh, he as a 13-year-old, as a teenager, came in for the opening of the bridge and then rolled his blanket up and slept at Wynyard Railway Station on the 19th of March, 1932. At 5am the next morning, he bought ticket number one for crossing the bridge by train. And uh, that was amazing. So ultimately, I inherited that rail ticket. It stimulated me to collect the bridge's history, uh, which I've now got some 6,000 pieces of in my personal collection. And that's really where originally the passion and interest in the bridge came from. But you had to get permission to, to enable people to climb the bridge. Yeah, How did you, yeah. and New South Wales is a pretty tough place to do these things. How did you go <laughs> about that? Well, look, we put together a, a, a business plan. Having climbed a group of people and watched their reaction, which was just quite amazing, uh, I thought I've just got to share this with, mm. uh, with the world. Uh, and we needed to find a way to make it safe and prudent and sensible to do and work in with the maintenance of the bridge and the traffic. Uh, so we put together a pretty comprehensive business plan. In fact, in the end, it took us two and a half years to put the business plan together in a very thorough sort of way and ultimately had that plan ready to present to the government. But how long did it take from the day you start <laughs> on that plan to the day you get the yeah. business going? Yeah, nine years and ten nine months. Nine years? Uh, yes, yes. What yes. on earth took nine years? Well, look, it was a gutsy call on the government to, uh, for a private individual to want the bridge leased and licensed to them for a long time, which is what I was seeking. 
and and really we were, we were a world's first so you know it, it's a valuable icon and there's a lot of traffic on it and there are unions and people on it so convincing them I think that we could do it and it would be totally safe and that the maintenance could continue uh, you know took a lot of doing a lot of environmental issues and a lot of people who wanted to have their thumbprint on the bridge. Who are the hardest people to convince? <laughs> well look state rail was probably one of the most challenging and one of their rules was you've got to wear, thou shalt wear a fluorescent orange jacket when you're within six yes. metres of rail track. Makes good sense. Yes, yes, yes. But we were putting people in a grey suit to blend them into the bridge and we were putting them on a one, one metre lanyard so you couldn't get anywhere near the trains. But oh no, there are our rules and it actually took two years uh, and I think 20 or 30 meetings with State Rail until ultimately uh, they came around. Uh, of course the, the, the workers on the bridge didn't have harnesses in the old days, did they? No, so they mightn't no. have wanted you up there either. Well, look, I think the workers probably, we were, we were happy to want to show their bridge off to the world, but they were probably a little concerned that this is our space uh, and uh, what changes have they got to make. And I think we were, in some ways we were, we were somewhat threatening uh, in that area and we needed to work really hard to get them on side. So how many people climb the bridge every day and every year, roughly? We're climbing a couple of hundred thousand people a year, Gee. so today five or six hundred people are climbing. Yes. It's a lot of people, isn't it? It is a lot of people, yeah. So yes. what do you learn about people when you put them in that situation? How many get halfway and stop and what happens? <laughs> well, we really prepare people well before they do the climb. They climb a simulator first. Uh, of course, it is totally safe. We've, uh, we haven't had a serious injury of any type. We haven't had a heart attack, despite the fact we've climbed two and a half million people over 11 years. So, you know, it, it's a thoroughly safe thing to do. But in terms of learning, I mean, some people are, have a discomfort with height. Yes. Um, and I think it, it enables them to overcome that. And we're climbing now people who are wanting to push boundaries. I mean, someone will make a booking and they've had a, a heart bypass operation only a week ago. So you're seeing that <laughs> sort of issue. You're yes. seeing people, we had a, a marriage proposal on the bridge this morning. So you're seeing all sorts of things, but you, you really are seeing people dealing with a very personal journey and a personal experience. Do you, do you learn something about entrepreneurs or CEOs in this process? <laughs> Look, people, you find weaknesses in them that you wouldn't have otherwise seen. Well, I think you see other aspects of people and people who are emotionally affected and you, you will see people with tears streaming out of their eyes and you think, why did that come from? Well, people, so many people have stories that relate to the bridge or its construction or there's some sort of personal emotional button that it pushes for them and so it takes people into another part of their lives that, that many don't frequently ever get into. Do companies use this as executive training? Yes, yeah, some of them do and, uh, uh, and certainly they, they're very interested in the systems of the way this works so we get a lot of people looking at the way we prepare and how thorough the entire system is and the feedback we get because I'm a quality control freak. Uh, and, and yes, they're, they're fascinated by those concepts and the way this works. Do you think a lot of our businesses don't have um, the requirement to be so exact as, as, it's, as it's required when there's a, a bridge climb? Well, probably one of the things that sticks out to me, I mean, uh, although there's a chief executive of this business and I'm the, the chairman, as it were, sure. chairman in inverted commas, but you know, I personally look after customer complaints uh, and that's all I have to do. If I do that, you know, the rest of the business. So you look after the customer complaints? Yeah. And, and what's the main one? Well look, you get a range of things. We get m many, many more compliments, but what we're, we're not looking for the compliments, we're really looking for the customer that might say, well look, I didn't pass your breath test this morning and maybe I wasn't handled as I thought I should have been. Uh, now we want to know those things. Uh, so. We would make a change to that business. The chief executive makes a change to that business probably once every fortnight and has done for 11 years as a result of customer feedback, uh, of a comment that a customer has made. And that's, that's gold to us. So you want to encourage that genuinely to happen. So who owns your business? <laughs> well, we have the bridge leased for a 20 year period. Okay. Uh, lived so you're about halfway. Yes, yes, yes. we've got uh, five shareholders. Yes. Uh, and uh, between us, uh, you know, it's a private business. And, and these are the original shareholders? Yes, uh, the, in fact, six of us. Uh, yes. In fact, the six who started uh, 
are still shareholders today. Uh, Brett Blundy was one of them. Brett Blundy. From yeah. Sanity. And yeah, Jack Cowan, they're the, the two major shareholders. And we've got three other sm sm small shareholders. And they've stayed with you the whole time? They have, yeah. And do you make lots of money? It, it's been a profitable business, it has. Uh, it was a long lead into this uh, and, and took a lot more time and money in, in an investment sense, but the business was an incredible financial and business success and we've worked hard at it you know, from day one. Paul, what's your advice to somebody who uh, has an idea um, and then runs into roadblocks, as you obviously must have run into for, yeah. for it to be a nine-year incubation? What's your advice to them? Rob and I previously had a lesson in my life where I, I stuffed up with a, a real estate start, site with Amber that I was wanting to buy an adjoining site and I mucked it up with the, the town planning guy and, and didn't with that bureaucrat to kiss his butt as I should have done at the time. And it was a great lesson to have uh, whilst I fundamentally were able by taking the council to court to, to land an environment to win that to win that court case. I won the battle, but I sure as hell lost the war. Yes. And it, it took a couple of years and a lot of money. Now, it was a good lesson to have before making bridge climb happen because the bridge is owned by the people and the government and there are so many areas of sensitivity we had to work with with bureaucracy and politics. And it was great to have had that lesson to understand the simplistic thing that of one needing to find solutions always to what may threaten or make a government or a bureaucrat uh, discomforted. But if you had have known back in 89 that it was going to take you nine years, would you have done it? <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't have. And, you know, but I, and I really think that sometimes it's good not to, not to know. You know, it, uh, I, I was guesstimating I could do this in two years. Uh, for a couple of million dollars, it costs several more millions of dollars and, uh, and uh, 10 years in effect. So uh, that was a tedious process, but you know, there was gold at the end of the rainbow. How did you live at that time? It was a really, really tough time. It was very tough. Uh, and, uh, but fortunately, I'm pretty obsessive and pretty anal and focused, uh, and, and it required a lot of uh, tenacity, but, but you know, we got there, thank goodness. Paul, have you tried to do this anywhere else in the world? Well, we'd love to, to be able to do that. We, I set up a separate company, Bridge Climb International. We've been working on a number of other icons, uh, and one of them that I can talk about is the Brooklyn Bridge in New York. And we've uh, had the Mayor of New York uh, work with us and is positive about yes, this. Yes. Uh, we had done a lot of work on that bridge over a couple of years with a team of people who've been working with me and uh, we w had heads of agreement uh, underway and then uh, I was on my way flying across there in fact when uh, an aeroplane flew into a building in New York and my team were waiting for me in the, the US. 9-11? Yeah, 9-11. Right. So, uh, and it stopped it? It stopped it. Uh, really? So, uh, and the cost of terrorism insurance, uh, which is about $5 billion to replace that bridge, is some tens of millions of dollars per annum. So you know, some interesting things we've got to Why deal with. Why did it stop it? Longer term, what, what, what caused, I understand why it might stop for two or three years, but why is it blocking it now? Well, that country, uh, and, and, and New York particularly, I think there's a lot of jumping at shadows, understandably, for terrorism. Yes. So, you know, we've just got to work with that. Ultimately, I think there'll be a solution, uh, ultimately, and uh, we're working still and striving to make that happen. Thanks, Paul. Thank you.